So good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Uh, we've been very lucky this week to have multiple hangouts with the, the speaker we're going to talk to in a minute. Uh, but before we get to her, I want to give each class a chance to do a bit of a shout out. We've got Eve's class, the grade uh, four in Toronto, Ontario, just starting to pour in. Hi, guys. Hi. And I need you right now. That's good. We've got Mr. Lavogues, grade eight in North Palm Beach in Florida. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Good. We've got Miss. We've got Evan. Evan is taking over today in Glenview, Illinois, grade four class. Hi, guys. Hi. We've got Mr. Thwaites, uh, many classes in St. Thomas, Ontario today. They're coming. They're just on their way, Jesse. Apologies. Hopefully they'll be here soon. <laughs> they'll be here soon. And we've got Miss Burns, grade threes in River Forest, which is the greatest city name of all time in Illinois. Hi, guys. <laughs> all right. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. We are joined live by Heidi Cornwell, who is at the River Station at the Intermountain Bird Observatory, uh, a project of Boise State University. They've joined us all week for some amazing hangouts, catching songbirds, catching raptors. Today, we're going to go out and catch some songbirds and see the research that we do. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Heidi. Hi, thanks, guys. So today I'm at a different station than I've been at all week. Um, we had been scheduled to be up at our Lucky Peak station this morning, um, but it's been pretty cold and you guys might be able to see it's a little bit windy this morning. Um, so I decided to try our river station. Um, when birds are migrating, they often can choose what kind of weather they want to be in. And when it's really cold on Lucky Peak, we normally have good numbers down here. So I'm hoping that our high mountain site, since it's really cold, that our low valley site here at the river um, will have some more birds for you guys to get to check out. Um, so I should start off by saying I am an ornithologist, so that means I study birds. And a lot of the work I do involves banding birds. So today we're hoping to catch tiny songbirds and attach little metal, little aluminum bands to their legs. Um, each of those bands has a nine-digit number um, and that allows us to individually identify that bird. So by putting that band on that bird's leg, it's almost like giving them a unique name tag or a unique phone number. So no other bird in the world is going to have that same number. Um, and the reason we're banding today, oh, and my biologists have a bird, so maybe we'll go check it out. Uh, the reason we're banding today is because it's fall migration and we're trying to figure out what birds are doing, when they're moving, where they're going, and where they're coming from. So, we're gonna check out this bird, walk over to our station. Oh, we have two birds, all right. So you guys will get to meet uh, my team of scientists here that are gonna be banding these birds. Let me switch the camera around. And, is it switching? We'll find out. There we go. So we've switched the camera. Our scientists have brought the birds back in little bags. Um, we'll get to check out the nets, um, maybe after we get to see these birds, but we'll check out the birds first. So we carry these birds in really soft cloth bags. That keeps them safe and calm. And then we take them out of the bag and we hold them in a grip called Bander's Grip. So you can see our scientist Matt here has a little ruby crowned kinglet that he's holding in Bander's Grip. And Joni also has a little ruby crowned kinglet with a little ruby crown, so a little male ruby crown kinglet. So the bander's grip that we're using, you can see their two fingers are around the neck of the bird, but they're really gently supporting that bird. So you guys can think of this as like when you guys go on a roller coaster ride and you have those big heavy shoulder straps around your shoulders, they're not squeezing you too tight, they're not stopping you from breathing, but they're kind of safely holding you and supporting you. So that's what these scientists are doing with that bander's grip. So our scientists are opening these bands, and I'll grab a band and show you guys. And then we're using pliers to attach the band to the bird's leg. And these pliers have a specialized hole so that we can close the band around the bird's leg without even touching that bird's leg. So here we go. We can see that pretty well there. 
else. So it looks like that plier is touching the bird, but it's actually not. And then we work to really carefully close that band because this bird is going to be wearing that band for the rest of its life. And so we want to make sure that that fits really nicely. So here's a little close up of this band. Um, let's see if I can get it to focus. It might not focus very well for you guys. There we go. So you can see those little tiny, tiny numbers on this band. There's a top and a bottom row, so we're able to squeeze a nine digit number on there. Oh, and we lost the video for a second, but I have a feeling we'll get it back. So our scientists are measuring these birds and taking a bunch of different characteristics from them to give us some good data that allows us to study these bird populations. So one of the things we do is we measure their wings and their tails to get an idea of the bird's size. And we also weigh the birds to get an idea that can allow us to calculate their body mass index. So kind of like we calculate BMIs for humans, we can do the same thing with the birds and uh, that allows us to figure out how healthy they are. There we go. So you can see Joni measuring the tail there. And we record all this data on these data sheets. So you can see each row there is a bird. So we've banded almost 25 birds just on this page alone. So after we measure their wing and their tail, one of the things we do is we blow on the bird's feathers. And it looks kind of funny to do that. And it might seem like, you know, why in the world are they blowing on those poor birds? So we're blowing on the feathers to part those feathers out of the way and look at the skin underneath. And that allows us to see a few different things. So what Joni's doing right now is looking at the skull of this bird. So just like humans, when we're born, if you guys have little brothers or sisters, you know that babies, when they're born, they have a soft spot on their head. Their head is kind of squishy. So their skull isn't fully formed. And on birds, it's actually the same. So we can actually look under their feathers, through their skin, and we can see how formed their skull is. So if their skull is not very formed, you can actually see pink color, which is the pink of their brain showing through their really thin little skull. And if their skull is fully formed, we'll see white. So we'll see the bone of the skull. One of the other things we do is we blow on their, the bird's bellies to try to see how fat they are. Um, and for migrating birds, we hope to see fat because that means their gas tank is full. So that means they're filled up with fuel and energy and ready to fly hundreds or even thousands of miles. Should we weigh this bird, Matt? Let's do it. Oh yeah, this scale takes a while to turn on. Uh, while we're waiting for the scale to turn on, can you blow on the belly so we can see the yeah. uh, fat and the muscle? Oh no, the video just went out. There's not yeah. a lot of fat on this bird, but... Oh, okay. Well, let's Good wait muscle. for the We can wait for the video to come okay. back. I think the closer I stand to the banding station, the worse the uh, reception gets. I'm going to step back a little bit and see if it improves. <laughs> so, when we blow on the bird's bellies, we can see their fat. We're also able to see their muscle. And their muscle shows up as kind of a reddish purple color. And their fat shows up as an orange color. So we can kind of see that contrast in color on the bird's bellies. Um, if they're really skinny, we can actually see their... Um, there we go. There's the video. All right, ready to blow on that belly mat? So there's that purple chest muscle on that bird. And not very much fat. Oh, wow, yeah. So there's a big dip in that chest of that bird where it's really, really skinny. It just has like a little hole instead of being full of fat. So this bird needs to fatten up a little bit if it's going to continue to migrate. And we'll watch Matt weigh this bird now. So we stick them head first in a little film canister that allows us to keep those birds still so that they don't fly away while we're... Uh, Da, da, da. There we go. 6.3 6 grams. So these little kinglets weigh um, about the same as 6.3 Skittles. That's it. Or 6.3 M&Ms. So they're not very heavy at all. And these two birds that we're banding today um, are one of the smaller species that we catch. Um, there's a few that are a little bit smaller at about 5 grams as far as songbirds go. Oh man, I lost video again. Um, 
And these are species that they might actually stay in Idaho for the winter, or they might keep flying south somewhere else like Arizona or even northern Mexico. Um, so one of the reasons we, can, we are looking at fat is it can actually give us an idea of whether these kinglets are going to stop and stay here in Idaho or whether they're going to keep flying and keep migrating um, farther south. So along with all that information I already told you about, we also look and try to figure out how old the birds are. So you probably saw before the video cut out um, that Joni and Matt were looking at the tail feathers and the wing feathers of this little kinglet. And they're trying to figure out how old it is by looking at the shape of the feathers and also the strength of those feathers. So kind of like you guys, how you have probably have some baby teeth and some of you might even have some grown-up teeth mixed in. Baby teeth and grown-up teeth are different shapes, and they're also different strengths. So adult teeth are much stronger than baby teeth. And the same thing is true with these birds. So baby feathers are much more pointy. Oh, here we can, now the video's back, you can see that little ruby crown kinglet with the ruby crown on the male's head, Joni's wing, this little guy. And then if we want, we could probably take these kinglets over to, we have a couple other visitors at our station from an Audubon Society group. Um, we could take these kinglets over to the visitors and uh, watch these little kinglets fly away. What do you think of this tail? Let's see. Let's look at tail shape. Oh, and I lost the video, so you guys won't be able to see this. Uh, it doesn't look... Can I see primary covert shape? Those don't look very good. So this bird has... Well, they're kind of rounded. I know. They're, yeah, they're, they're that's a tricky cleaner. one. <laughs> like so these birds are uh, kind of difficult to age. So they have sort of pointy tail feathers, um, which would tell us that they were young. And they have sort of pointy, sort of thin wing feathers. Um, there's our video back again. Which, so we're looking for either pointy or rounded, so... Let's see. Let's look closer. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to just, like, walk away from this shipping container because I keep losing uh, video. But those feathers, I think that tail looks pretty adult-like. I'm right? leaning adult, yeah. Okay. I agree. Yeah. I think it looks adult. All right, so maybe... you got an adult male and a baby, baby lady. I like that. So maybe let's... So, so that we can see these birds fly. This reception is pretty bad, so let's step away from the shipping sure. container and we'll take them over here. And, uh, oh, there's our video. Woohoo! We'll uh, let one of our Audubon Society people release these birds if they want. What do you guys want to do it? Arlene, should we go? Should we race to it? All right. <laughs> so let's zoom in while we have video and look at this nice little kinglet crown. So male ruby crown kinglets have this amazing little red crown on their head. Um, the females don't have that, so that makes it pretty easy to tell these guys apart, which is kind of nice. I wish I could do a side by side in a second. Yeah, we can do a side by side comparison of male versus female kinglet. That'll be kind of nice. The males are also a tiny, tiny bit bigger, but that would be pretty hard to tell um, if you were just bird watching. So the males, their wings are maybe 58, 59, 60 millimeters long. And the females, I lost the video again. Okay. <laughs> the females, their wings are maybe 55 millimeters long. So not a very big size difference. So it's kind of nice that we have uh, these um, plumage differences that can help us tell them apart. So once the video pump comes back, we'll uh, <laughs> release these little kinglets. <laughs> I thought we had been up at our Lucky Peak station and we were losing reception a lot. I thought reception would be, would be better down here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Let's Quick. do it. Oh, we have video. Woohoo, we have video. So we're going to just set these birds on these visitors hands and let them get out of here. Oh, I just lost it again. Oh, well. Oh, look at that. So hopefully we get the video back. <laughs> oh, yay, yay. I'm glad it was at least showing the video for uh, processing these birds, so getting to see them up close. The second one was a young female. Yeah, the first one was an animal. All right, so we don't have any birds. Um, I could take you guys 
if the video is going to work, I can uh, take you guys to check out uh, one of the nets to see how we catch the birds. Oh, okay. And uh, then I can probably take some questions for you guys. What do you guys think? Sounds great. Oh, there's our video. So we'll walk. We have these nets spread out in the vegetation. So we're hoping that as birds are flying back and forth in between the bushes, um, that they get caught in these thin little nets called mist nets. So they're really fine, really soft nets that allow us to kind of safely catch these birds um, as they're coming through this station during migration. So we'll see if my video comes back when I get to the net. I'm taking you guys over near the Boise River, so I didn't mention earlier, but one of the reasons we are studying this area is it's along the banks of the river, and it's in some habitat that is a little bit threatened in Idaho. So in a lot of places in Idaho, our river habitat is disappearing, and all the beautiful cottonwood trees and different plants that grow along the river, oh, there we go, are disappearing. And so one of the things we're doing with our research is trying to show how valuable and how important this habitat is for birds and hopefully convince people that we need to protect it. So you guys got a little peek of the river there and we'll see if, uh, I'll go stand by the net and see if our reception will let me show you guys our net for just a second. Um, hopefully it'll pop back. Um, but, well, while we were, wait were waiting, I could probably take some questions and we'll see if it co comes back. Are you guys still hearing me okay at least? We can hear you fine. That's great. That's good. <laughs> questions, and then if the net appears, we'll just cut the questions short really quickly to, to show that to everyone, okay? Sounds good. Great. Let's go to Eve's class to start. Uh, if you guys have a question, you want it? Yeah, so please use the computer when you say it. Yeah, that's how I get in the monitor to the computer. Just, I love how, your question. How, how old can birds get? Ooh, how old can birds get? That's a really good question. So, bird banding is actually a really great way to figure out how old birds can get. Um, when we just look at their feathers, we can tell if it's a young bird, so if it was born this year, or if it's older, up, and we would call that an after hatch year, so it's older than the year that it hatched. But then after that, we can't really tell how old they get unless we band them. Oh, here's our net. So you guys can see this really fine mesh, and this net is spread out from that pole all the way to this pole. So it's about 12 meters long, and you can see on the video, it's actually really hard to see that net unless my hand is there. So that's our net. Um, as far as how old birds can get, um, some of the records for some of these tiny little songbirds, like the size of a ruby crown kinglet, some of the records are actually 16 years old and even 20 years old for some species. So they can actually live a very, very long time. Um, for birds, the toughest part of their life is that first year. So they're trying to figure out their life and what they're doing. Uh, they have to learn how to eat and not get eaten. But once they survive that first year, they're, they're pretty well off, and they usually survive um, for a good amount of time after that. We catch a lot of birds at this station and our Lucky Peak station that are about six or seven years old on average. Excellent. Very cool. All right, let's go to Mr. Laveau's class. You guys have a question? <laughs> Malik, want to ask your question? Have you ever injured a bird? So have a bird as have you ever injured a bird while you were working with it? Oh, good question. So that's one of the things that we work the hardest not to do, right? So we never want to harm the birds we're studying. Otherwise, it wouldn't really make sense to study them, right? Um, so we take training really seriously. So we train for one or two years at least before somebody is allowed to band birds by themselves. Um, and usually we wait even longer than that. So all our scientists you guys saw today have been working for us for at least three years or working at other banding stations. Um, there is a risk to banding. So sometimes we'll catch birds with what's called wing strain. So it, you can kind of think of it as like a twisted ankle for a human, but instead it's the bird's wing. And so what we'll see is they'll sometimes fly off, 
kind of favoring that wing, kind of like you might limp when you twisted your ankle. Um, the nice thing is we actually did some research um, in combination with some other scientists to figure out whether birds recovered from that, whether it was a bad thing, and how we could make sure that we don't injure the birds when we're banding them. Um, and we found that birds recover from that wing strain. So although we don't like it when that happens, um, it's kind of an example of the risk involved, but also the way that scientists are always working to make sure uh, we protect these birds as best as possible. So yeah, it does happen, but very, very rarely. Um, all right, let's go to Miss Michael's group, or sorry, Evan, Evan to do. Yeah, that's us. Introduce, introduce Julie. Introduce Julie, Julie gonna do a question. Right yeah, so if you catch a big bird, do you still put a band on it? Yes and no, that's a good question. So if we catch a big bird, do we still put a band on it? Um, down at this station, we're only trapping songbirds. And so the biggest band I have is a band that would go on a large woodpecker called a northern flicker, which you guys might have where you live. Um, and that's a size three band. The biggest band you can put on a bird is a size nine band, and that goes on golden eagles. So we keep some kind of large and medium sized bands in stock just in case. Um, but if, for example, we somehow caught a red tailed hawk or an owl, then we wouldn't be able to band it. But we have caught at one point an American kestrel here, which is a small falcon. And we've also caught a Cooper's hawk, which is kind of a medium sized um, hawk. So it does happen down here. Um, at our Lucky Peak station, we purposely catch hawks. And so then we have all sorts of bands for those guys. And you can watch those videos on YouTube right now on the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Yeah. Show. Cool. Yeah, you can watch them. You can see the Cooper socks that we caught yesterday. Uh, all right, let's go to Ms. Burns' class. Do you guys have a question? What type of rare birds do you catch? What rare birds do we catch? So. As bird banders, we're always really excited when we go to the net and we have no idea what kind of bird is in the net. That's always exciting. Um, so down here, one example of that is we caught a bird called a black pole warbler, which is a species that lives in the eastern United States and Canada, but we're in the western United States, in Idaho, here. So we were not expecting that bird. There's been a few others found in Idaho in the past. Um, but it was pretty cool to walk up to the net and know that this bird had come thousands and thousands of miles to get to us here in Idaho. So sometimes that happens where a bird is migrating and, you know, they have a little built-in compass that tells them where to fly, how far, what direction. Sometimes that compass gets a little bit broken. So as scientists, it's always interesting uh, to catch those birds that are a little bit messed up, it seems like. Um, so we banded it just like any other bird and sent it on its way and who knows where it ended up. Hopefully it made it to the right spot in the end where it was hoping to go. Uh, all right, let's go to Mr. Thwaites' class. You guys have a question? Yeah. Oh, you got a question? Yeah. Take your time, no hurry. It's loud. Here we go, Jesse, for a sec. Hello. Um, what is the toughest bird to band? What's like, the most aggressive? <laughs> the most aggressive. So sometimes we banders joke about this and we we debate because it's not a clear cut answer. So black cap chickadees, which are tiny, so about the size of those ruby crown kinglets that you guys saw, they are one of the meanest birds we catch. They try to bite us. They also, after we let them go, they actually stay and they sit in the tree above our heads and they yell at us. So they're pretty fierce, even though they're really tiny. Um, as far as a big bird, I think the ones that I don't love banding as much are the large falcons, so the peregrine falcon and the prairie falcon. Um, when we band raptors, we hold on to their feet, and if you guys watch that video, you'll get to see that with the cooper's hawk. And with something like a cooper's hawk, you hold its feet, and if it bites you, you know, it kind of hurts, but not that bad. Um, because hawks, they don't use their beak for killing their prey. But falcons, they have extra sharp beaks because they actually use their beaks to kill their prey before they eat it. So if a falcon finds your finger and bites your finger, it does really hurt. Um, 
we don't wear gloves when we're banding the birds because, you know, as much as I would love to protect my fingers, the most important thing is protecting the hawk. And if I had big, thick gloves on, I wouldn't be able to tell how gently I was holding the hawk, um, and I could injure it. So instead of wearing gloves, I just kind of put up with it and uh, get bit sometimes. But, yeah. But if a black-capped chickadee was the same size as a peregrine falcon, I'd be way more scared of the black-capped chickadee because they're so feisty and, and mean. Very unexpected answer. I love it. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, do you have time for one more slate of questions, one from every class? Right. Yeah. So we have a couple birds, so I'll show you guys birds while, uh, while right. we answer questions. Let's start with Eve's class again. Yeah, you guys are good. Yep. <laughs> it's a pretty net five. 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 Net um, man, that was a long time ago. So I've been banding birds for 10 years. Uh, it was definitely a songbird, and it was at our Lucky Peak station. So probably a McGillivray's warbler or a warbling vireo. Um, but I have to admit, I don't really remember. But at this site, at the Boise River site, the first bird that ever got banded here was a uh, gray cat. Tell me again what I have them in my backyard. So, Heidi, you said that you've been doing it for 10 years. How long has the observatory been active? That's a good question. So, the observatory has been around um, doing hawk research since 1993. And we started songbird banding research. Well, not me. Uh, the Bird Observatory started songbird banding research in 1997, so we've been studying birds a long time, and one important reason to do that is the longer you study birds, the more you can get information about long-term population trends. So are there changes, are the populations going up or down? Um, you need a lot of years of data to really be able to understand what's happening with bird populations. So. Now that we have almost 25 years of data, we're able to really understand what's happening with birds in Idaho and then compare that with other stations that have been banding for a long time um, and kind of piece together the whole puzzle of what's happening in North America. All right, let's go back to Mr. Lebeau's class. Uh, we, were, we were just talking. We wanted to know what's the... What's the species of bird that that you're hoping to find that you would get on the walkie-talkie and call everybody to come over? Like, what's that holy grail of birds that you're looking for? <laughs> um, well, probably the most exciting bird would be one that we could never predict. So when we caught that black pole warbler, I was pretty wowed. I was not expecting um, that at all. So any of the East Coast birds would be pretty exciting. Um, as far as at this station, one species that we hear almost every day but have never caught is a black-billed magpie, and we think that would be pretty cool. Um, they are a little bit big for our nets, and so we've actually had one run into the net, but it was so big that it bounced out, it couldn't get caught. Um, so yeah, if we caught that one, I'd be pretty excited. And be sure to, if a flamingo ever makes its way from Africa and you catch it, please call us. We'd love to do a hangout with that, okay? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. That'd be uh, exciting. Let's go back to Evan. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Evan, <laughs> go in front of the Let's go back to Evan. And uh, you guys have a Will is going to do the next question. Go for it, yeah. All right. Can you accidentally hurt a bird landing it? Could, especially if you didn't have training hurt a bird. Um, you guys saw that really safe uh, banders grip that we use to hold the birds. And so that allows us to really safely hold them without anything bad happening. Um, but yeah, if you weren't trained, uh, you could so easily hurt a bird. So we're always very careful um, to train volunteers and crew for a long time before they're allowed to even touch a bird. 
Uh, before we go to the next question, just really briefly, Heidi, yesterday you mentioned the Instagram page, the Intermountain Bird Observatory. So for yes. all the classes, I just want to really highlight that. It is amazing. Yes. Some beautiful, beautiful pictures of their work and all the birds they capture. So do check that out when you're done. And I'll send you yes. guys the link the moment we're uh, finished this hangout, too. Yes. All right. Uh, let's go to Miss Burns' class. You guys just have to come up and demute your mic. <laughs> we might take a couple questions from you because I've never seen hands go up that quickly <laughs> in one class. Oh, dear. Yep, whenever you're demuted, we'll, uh, we'll be good. We can't hear you quite yet. You're still muted. You have to come up and demute your own microphone, guys. Sorry. Take your time. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and okay, go ahead. What's the average bird you catch? What's the average, average number of birds? Yeah. The average number of birds you catch a day during migration? That we catch number of birds we catch a day. That's a good question. So it varies a lot. Um, last week we had a lot of south winds, so winds coming from the south and going north. So that was pushing against the direction that the birds wanted to migrate. The birds want to go from north to south. So that wind was stopping them and blocking them. And so we were only catching about 10 birds a day. Um, now the wind shifted to be from the north. And so that's kind of carrying the birds and helping them migrate. And so we're expecting to get, you know, anywhere between 40 and 80 birds a day now. Um, now that especially this is kind of the end of migration and so all those ruby crown kinglets like you guys got to see um, are coming through in really big numbers right now so those kind of boost our numbers um, and make up the majority of the birds that we ban so they're probably one of our most abundant species All right, Ms. Burns' class, because you guys have to come up and demute things, if you guys have a second question, uh, go for it. All right, go ahead. Um, what do you use to make for the nets um, when you're catching the birds so they don't get hurt? Good question. So these nets are specially made by a company that only creates nets for bird banders. And so they're really, really soft mesh. And then they have some stretchy line called trammel line that's holding them all together. So when the birds run into the net, it's very springy. And so they kind of bounce. And the net has little pockets in it like hammocks. So when the birds run into the net, they kind of hang like in a little scoop shape um, in that hammock. Um, so that they can be safe while we're taking them out of the net. Um, so they can be safe while we're taking them out of the net. Um, well, if you cut out Heidi, but if you're still there, um, we'll take one last question from Mr. Thwaites' class. You guys have any more? I can hear you. Okay, good. Now I can hear you. Yeah, any questions, Mr. Thwaites' class? No. All right, guys, if people are coming in, uh, so Heidi, what we'll do then is I'm going to demute everyone's microphones. So Eve's class, Evan's group, Miss Burns' class. If you guys could join me in saying a big thank you to Heidi for everything she did today. So thank you, Heidi. Thanks, guys. Uh, All right. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm, I'm good. I'm gonna send those pictures to all of you guys. You can check them out soon. Heidi, thanks so much for joining us so many times in the last couple of weeks, and uh, we yeah. look forward to having you back anytime. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks.